And he's going to go right on back to doing puppy things. He's going to jump on me, and he's going to try to lick my hand, and he's going to want to be petted. And, and it's going to be one of these weird situations where I'm going to be like all feeling mad, and he's going to be like trying to be friends, you know? And, and I'm like, part of me just wants to leave him in there so I don't have to deal with that. And then there's this other option that I could have. I could lift it up and I could just still be mad and be like, no, I'm not going to spend any time. But he, that's, he's not going to understand that. It's not going to make sense to him. He's not going to. And I had this weird psychological, social, moral dilemma at this moment in time with my dog where I realized, I realized if the sin's been paid for, then the wrath has to be gone. And... So I lifted up the basket and I knelt down and he's all excited because the basket's gone. And I knelt down and I said, oh, Scooter, you're going to teach me about forgiveness, aren't you? My wife looked at me and said, what? (laughs) But there's the deal. If the sin has been paid for, there is no reason for wrath. The carpet was clean. The basket was gone. Full reconciliation was the only option. Unless I were some kind of vindictive sort of grudge-holding person who felt superior and like I didn't care for this animal at all. But if I loved this animal in the slightest, if I cared for this animal or if I even knew the animal's weakness, I would have to say full reconciliation is the only possible option. And if your heavenly father loves you, and if he has paid for the penalty of sin, and if he has granted you righteousness, then there is nothing left to stand in the way between you and him. Full reconciliation is the only right result of that situation. Now, if Adam messed up the world for us back in the garden, and Paul is now telling us that full reconciliation is possible, Paul kind of needs to address that whole Adam situation one more time and create the contrast that needs to be created between what Adam did in the garden and what Jesus has done for us. And that's exactly where Paul goes next in this chapter. If you get to chapter 5, verse 15, he begins talking about Adam. He says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who's a pattern of the one to come. And that confusing situation is like, wait a minute, what just happened here? And it's because of what's going on with Paul. Okay, check this out. Paul is dictating to another guy named Tertius. We find his name in chapter 16. He's dictating to a guy named Tertius. And Paul is so all of a sudden excited and wrapped up in what he's about to talk about. Because he just talked about how because we've been made righteous, then we're fully reconciled. We're standing in a state of grace. And he's so burdened. He's so excited. He's so, so thrilled about what he's talking about that he gets that first verse out and it's not even a full sentence. He changes his topic slightly because he's, he's rushing through this concept and he's like, okay, there's sin and there's law and there's Moses and there's Adam and the law came through Moses. The sin came through Adam. And finally he gets down to the bottom. He's like, okay, here's the deal. Here's the deal. It's where I started in verse one. It's where I'm ending at the end of this little section here. Death is in charge. Verse 14, death reigns. Verse 12, sin entered the world and death came through sin and death comes to all people because all sinned. That's his point. He's like, no matter if you have the law or you don't have the law, you all die. Everybody dies because everybody sins. Sin is just in the world. And then he gives us this really weird phrase there at the end where he says, Adam was a pattern of the one to come. Almost as if Adam somehow is a is a picture of what Jesus is when Jesus comes. In fact, Adam is the anti-Jesus. And Jesus is the anti-Adam because where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. Where Adam sinned, Jesus never sinned. And so now Paul is going to begin to tell us the contrast of the difference between these two things. 
and to try to unpack for us the difference that it makes in our lives. And he's going to end by telling us what the hope is that he mentioned earlier. So we just have to unpack it. We just have to dig into it. And in order for us to do that, I'm going to walk through it verse by verse after I give you a little perspective on some words Paul is going to be using. Okay, so here we go. Words number one, we're going to find two words for sin in this passage. And this is, this is some intellectual grammar kind of stuff. It really jazzes me up to talk about it. It, makes, it means something to me. If it doesn't really connect with you, then just get the big meaning as we talk about it. But hopefully this will make, something, make some sense for you. There are two Greek words for sin. The first word is paraptoma. And that's the word translated in our version here, trespass. When we get to the word trespass, it comes from the word paraptoma. And that's a word that means an activity, an action of wrongdoing. That's what a trespass is. It's breaking the law. It's wrongdoing. Something that I have done. It's an action. The second word is hamartano. And hamartano is a word that can either mean sin, the specific sin that I've done, or it can mean sin generally speaking. The, the sin that everybody has. We're all sinners. We all have done hamartano. We, it's just part of who we are. Okay, here are two words. So, so sin, the second word, hamartano, is kind of the result of individual acts of wrongdoing. Adam eats from the tree that he's not supposed to eat from. That's an individual act of wrongdoing. That's a trespass. As a result, he's now a sinner. It's part of who he is. So the first one is the act. The second one is the result. And as we look through these verses, you'll find in verse 15, the word is trespass. In verse 16, the word is sin, and it comes in the context of a result. In fact, the word result shows up right there at the beginning of verse 16. The reason that's important is that there are also two words for grace, excuse me, two words for gift in this passage. And the two words for sin help us understand that Paul is talking about an act and a result. So then when we get to the two words for gift, we can understand what they're about. Here are the two words for gift. The first word is charisma. And we're not talking about the X factor. We're not talking about that, that special something that someone has that makes everybody want to be their friend, the popularity charisma kind of thing. We're not talking about that, although that is, you could describe it as some sort of gift. Charisma is a word that only Paul uses with the exception of Peter. Peter uses it once in 1 Peter chapter 4. Paul uses it like 20 times. They're mostly in Romans and 1 and 2 Corinthians. It's often translated spiritual gift. It was translated spiritual gift in Romans chapter 1 verse 11. But if you'll notice, I bolded the first word there, charis. Do you remember what charis means? I mentioned it earlier today. It means grace. Charisma just simply means a specific moment or instance of grace. When Andrew gives a basketball to his one-and-a-half-year-old son, it's not because he's obligated to do it. It's because it's an act of grace. It's a charisma gift. It's an act of grace. That's the way we should understand that. It's an act of grace. It's the activity. The second word, dorea, is just a generic word for gift. It has no overtones pretty much whatsoever. If I go to your birthday party and I give you a gift... Whether I feel obligated to do it or whether I'm doing it because of grace, it doesn't matter. It's still a gift. Regardless of my motive, as long as I'm handing something to someone else, that's a gift. That's what Dorea is. So Dorea is just a simple gift, but maybe it's associated with a result. Okay, so here's the deal. Two words for sin. One is an action. One is a result. Two words for gift. The top one is used as an action, an act of grace. The second one is used as the result. Go ahead and walk, walk through it with me. Verse 15. But the gift and this first use of gift is the charisma word. So I'm going to translate it that way. But the act of grace is not like the act of wrongdoing, the trespass. For if the many died by the act of the wrongdoing of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift, and this is the normal gift. The second word gift is the normal gift, the end result gift, the just handing something to someone gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Now hang on here. At the beginning of the verse, there's an act of grace. At the end of the verse, there are two graces. One is the grace of God and the other one is the grace of Jesus. You see that? 
The gift that shows up in the second half of this verse is just the normal, everyday, average, ordinary word for gift. In other words, what Paul is saying is God has done something for you. Jesus has done something for you. And what they've done for you is completely different than what Adam did. Because Adam did this one wrong thing and the end result is death. God did an act of grace and the end result is a gift. But he doesn't tell us what the gift is yet. Verse 16, nor can the gift, and this is the normal word gift, the Dorea gift, nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of the one man's sin. So what God gives to you can't be compared to what Adam gave to you. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift, again, the normal, everyday, average, ordinary word gift, but uh, no, excuse me, the second gift there, verse 16, should be translated the act of grace. It's the charisma word. So let me say that again. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the act of grace followed many trespasses and brought justification. Okay, I have to draw this out for you in a chart. Okay, this will be up on the screen. You might want to jot this down. But this is what Paul is trying to say. Those, first, those two verses, 15 and 16, Paul is trying to draw a chart for us. He says, one act of wrongdoing leads to death and condemnation. Okay? But a whole lot of acts of wrongdoing, followed by one act of grace, leads to justification. Which is stronger, grace or sin? That's his point. One act of grace can offset all the wrongdoing and bring justification or righteousness. Even though one act of wrongdoing can create condemnation and death, just one act of grace is all it takes to offset all the wrongdoing that's ever been done by everybody. Grace is so much more powerful. So if you have grace, sin's defeated. The results of sin are defeated, but he doesn't give us the gift name yet. That happens in verse 17. Check it out. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift, normal word gift, of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Here's the whole thing pulled together for you. Okay? God does an act of grace, and you get the gift of righteousness. God does an act of grace, and the end result is you get made righteous. This is a summary of everything that Romans 4 and 3 were 